This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, episode 106. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood, and I'm here with my bald, beautiful, amazing, purple-shirted co-host, Christopher J. Graham. Hey, who guys, is, hey, who is a pleasure to be here. Oh, man, thanks for having me on the show, Brian. Oh. See, every time you do that, we lose at least 37 listeners when you do that stupid voice. Well, they can go... Uh produce music or something <laughs> i don't know what you were going to say there. I don't know either. how are you doing man dude i'm fantastic i'm uh hanging out here with one of my one of my homeboys one of my OGs. Well, don't, don't talk what? about that yet we're not, we're not to him yet but we're I'm talking excited. about you right now no we're talking about you right now how are you doing chris i'm great i started going to a chiropractor and that's been fun is that where they like crack your back and do all sorts of weird adjustments? And it's like, yeah, I went to one once because I had like a, an issue with primary exertional headaches. So when I go to the gym and try to like squat 315 pounds, <laughs> I would just get headache that would last three days. So when you exert yourself, you get headaches. And then he, he did some stuff and then I, I was cured. So that was, that's that amazing. Was great. Yeah. Yeah. It's been Fun good. Facts. My wife and I are both going and yeah, it's making me feel younger so far. So good. I'll report back later. Great. The show brought to you by chiropractic doctors. Stop. I awkwardly paused there to see if you'd ask how I'm doing, but you didn't. So we're going to move on in this interview. Hey, I was going to move. I want to make a joke. I was going to make it. Brian, how are you doing? No, 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 no. You, you lost that chance today. Actually, I'm, I'm doing okay, but my coffee roaster's going out right now. It's on the way out. The heating element's going. I can't roast any more coffee, really. That's terrible. And so this is the one area that I'm a gear slut. Like... <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> coffee roasting gear, me and you are on Marco, like dreaming about and like drooling over specific coffee roasters, like at home drum roasters that are like $1,500. And I'm thinking about pulling the trigger on a, a really expensive home roaster. Our fantasy is to get a fancy coffee roasting company to send us free coffee roasters, possibly several. Yeah. Uh, sponsor this podcast, please. Yeah. Let's move on today. Today, Chris, who do we have on the podcast today? This is the more important thing. My brother from another mother, fellow Westervillian, Westerville, Ohio, and Brandon Reich. Westervillian. Westervillian. That's good. Westervillian. It doesn't sound very good. Westervillian. It's like a bad it's like guy. It's like a villain. It's got the word villain in yeah. it. It's fine. Yeah. I think we're fine with that. But yeah, we live in Westerville. It's weird that Brandon lives here. Brandon is far too successful, talented, and brilliant uh, to live in Westerville. But for some reason, a lot of like ballers live here in Westerville. Let me tell you about Brandon. Brandon's worked for every band you've ever heard of. When I was doing my research before this, <laughs> like I knew some of the bands you work with, Brandon, but I'm like looking this up. I'm like, holy shit. Holy shit. Holy shit. What the fuck? I'm like every single band. I'm like, it's bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. so like when you say every band you've ever heard, of, I'm pretty sure he's worked with every band anyone has ever heard of. And that's not an exaggeration. Totally. And so I'm going to tell a little bit of nice things about you, but Brandon was a rock star and uh, decided he wanted to do merch design for bands and that went really well he has like i said worked with every band you've ever heard of brandon let me ask you a question how many grammy award-winning artists do you think you've collaborated with i don't know i've never thought of it in terms of grammy i mean i guess i would want to go through a list of the ones i didn't work with i mean like it and when you're in the merchandise industry you get to kind of like touch almost every mm -hmm. entity from the Beatles to Led Zeppelin to Carrie Underwood to Rascal Flats and then into rock and roll with Slipknot and My Chemical Romance. And I mean, there is very, you know, very few times will I watch any music thing and not feel some type of connection to some project that I worked on at some point in time. I think one thing that's really cool about designing merch is that your client list gets to like build really huge and you get to use all those names when really you're not working directly with those artists all the time. A lot of times you're working with merchandising companies and you know, they're just like, you know, having you do a few things for whatever gigantic artist. So it looks a lot um, more impressive than it feels on a daily basis. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I can pinch myself and think about how cool it is that I get to have anything to do with any of these bands or artists or whatever. Um, but that's kind of, you know, that's actually a really great point that we'll talk about later on how that was really great, but it wasn't 
where I wanted to be ultimately. And I wanted to move on from that. Look at you building suspense for the podcast. And people are like, I was going to press pause, but now I'm going to listen because he's intrigued me. So some of you might be thinking, why is Brandon on? What does a merch designer have to say to us in the audio arts field? Here's the thing, man. One, Brandon has been in bands. Brandon has worked with producers. Brandon has had hit songs. But more importantly, Brandon works with all the people that all of us want to work with, providing a slightly different service. Right. He provides creative services to the best bands in the world, the best artists in the world, the biggest labels in the world. And as a result of that, he's going to be able to bring home a lot of that wisdom and help us learn how we can run our businesses better and to think about the mindset of the ideal customers that we're going after anyways. Right. I mean, I think you and I as friends, we, you know, we'll have lunch quite a bit and we'll constantly draw the parallels between what it is that I'm doing, what it is that you're doing. I mean, essentially we're taking an artist and trying to figure out how to make the best choices for that artist. Yep. That applies to both design, branding, and audio. Totally, man. So can you give our listeners a 30,000 foot view over you, your agency, how big your team is, and, and kind of what you guys do from on a day-to-day basis as far as your projects? Right. So today I have an agency called Tension Division. I founded it with my business partner, Joel Cook, back in fall of 2017. Um, We essentially partner with a band um, throughout the course of the album cycle and we build a story. We get in at the ground level. Ideally, we're getting in while they're writing the record. Ideally, we're in there in the studio and we get to hear songs or we get to we get to hear stuff before it's finished um, when it's kind of malleable enough that we can still apply some type of opinion or creative direction or something like that. And from there, um, we're able to find the story, extract kind of the truth of the whole entire thing, extract the real core elements of who this band is, how this band wants to be perceived, what their actual unique point of view is. All of these things are kind of driving forces for the decisions that we're going to make creatively throughout the whole course. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of graphic designers out there who just design an album cover and that's that whatever album cover looks coolest and that wins. We don't really take that approach. Our approach is, no, why do you exist? Why should anyone care about you? Why does this record that you're making matter? And what is it about? And um, how can we most effectively translate that meaning with visuals? Mm -hmm. But the visual, you know, it it really bleeds outside of just visual because we're, we're definitely making a lot of like, creative decisions that are more about video, more about tour visuals, more about all this other stuff, but also like, yeah, but why do you do it? Is this a, is this the right decision to make? We kind of bleed into a lot of record label type decisions or management type of decisions or all these are PR type of decisions. So when you start realizing that like, here's the service that we offer, the mini, the list of services that we offer, it still bleeds outside of those confines quite a bit. And what's cool for us is that there's not really an agency that's doing all of this. Um, I think a lot of agencies, it makes a lot of sense for most agencies to specialize in one thing and hand it off to the next cog in the machine, right? But for us, you know, me specifically, after being one of those cogs, I understood that, yeah, but if we're not able to take this creative vision out to completion, then the brand is going to get scattered. And if the brand gets scattered, there is no there's no reason to really see a movement and want to take part in that movement. And the reason it's more important than it uh, now than it used to be is that we can scroll through Spotify and hear a song that we kind of like, but if we lose attention at all, we're on to the next hundred songs that we might like. So the um, battle for your eyeballs and the battle for your attention is much more severe and cutthroat than it was 20 years ago when it was like, if you like, Pearl Jam and Nirvana and all of the other bands that went along with that. So it was more like, I love this group of artists and that is enough for me. Mm. That's not the way it is today. Today it is, you know, take like My Chemical Romance, uh, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. My Chemical Romance, that defined everything about a kid's life is I am a fan of My Chemical Romance. That is who I am. You know, today it is, I am a fan of 21 Pilots. That's who I am. I am a fan of Billie Eilish. I am a fan of whoever. So there's an opportunity for a band to not only build this big fan base, but also on the consumer side, on the kid's side, that fan has a 
tool to define who they are and give their life purpose and meaning. And once you get that far and you realize how much this stuff actually matters, it is a pretty massive motivator for branding in the music industry. It's not just about making bands look cool. It's about making fans have a sense of purpose and making sure that the content that you're spitting out with along with these bands and, and um, as a representative of, the, of this band has substance and matters. What I don't want is to work with an artist. And when I say, why do you exist in whichever fancy way I ask them that question, they have nothing for me because if that band doesn't care why they exist, then I don't care. And I don't really care about trying to promote and campaign for a band that doesn't have more to say than just cool songs. Dude. So I have a couple of things I got to say on this one. It's wild to me, like sitting here talking to you about this and thinking back how long we've been friends. Mm -hmm. And number two, it's wild to me thinking about how many hours we've spent talking about tension division. Right. But when you're on a podcast with somebody like you're in presentation mode and that was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like that makes like I've spent so much time talking about tension division, but I feel like I understand it more based on what you just said. And I, and I would say the third thing is we talk a lot about the power of story on this podcast. We love Donald Miller's story brand and we love encouraging people that when you're talking to a band or talking to an artist, asking them questions about their story and seeing them as the hero in the story and you as at best a guide that that's the path forward to getting to finding ways to add value. And I, I I'm, it's like hitting me. I don't think I know anybody that's better at finding ways to not finding ways, but that's better at asking questions to an artist or a band to figure out what is their story and then getting the, the, the big picture of the story that that band is in and that their place in the world. And I'm like, <laughs> this is hilarious. I'm saying, wow, you're so articulate, but I'm not being very articulate in the way that I'm explaining this. So this is really cool. I think our audience is going to go nuts for your perspective on this stuff. You know, it's interesting because there's a lot of connections here. So we've probably been friends 13, 12, 13 years, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. So when I moved to Columbus, Chris was one of, one of my first friends and, first new friends, a, a person from a group that I hadn't previously been around or knew or whatever. I knew a few friends before I moved to Columbus that lived here. But so what's interesting about what you're saying is that there was this commonality that I think I was always searching for when it came to making friends and friendships. And then when I became friends with you, be became friends with Colin, became friends with et cetera, et cetera. Let me hop in right here real quick. We just interviewed Seth Mosley on the last episode and he's friends with all these guys too. These are the House of Heroes guys. Well, the thing is that there is this prerequisite, unsaid prerequisite with band guys or music guys because we've all, we've all sort of agreed to take a unconventional path to, you know, I think starting the band will, will already say that you are opting for an unconventional path and whatever it is about the conformist route or the status quo is not interesting to you, right? So what I'm leading to is the fact that all of these bands that we now work with, I believe there is something pretty special and poignant and substantial inside of them, whether they know it or not. Mm. So even you can take, let's just take AJ Babcock, for example, right? Relatively quiet guy, whatever. But I know there is something very unique about him that Amen. that yeah. we would have to pull out because it does, just because you're in a band doesn't mean you're talkative or whatever. But there is something special and unique inside of you. So I feel like with most artists, it is going to be very rare for me to go to an artist and try to start finding these answers to these questions that I have and not be able to dig something up. I think there's something in there, but I have to figure out a way to earn their trust and to create a safe space to share it because there's also a, usually a callous exterior that you have to get through with, with a rock star or whatever. I think of Caleb Shomo, for example, like there was something, you know, Beartooth being this amazing band that they are and just this heavy band that they are, there is something very, vulnerable inside of Caleb yeah. that he was able to share with me. And Caleb's honesty allowed me to get some clarity on what it is Beartooth was and specifically what that record disease was about. Totally. And to kind of hop in here, you did all the work for that. Right. You've worked with Beartooth. Like th let's just sort of like right now, 
who are the bands you're working with? What are some projects that our audience are familiar with that you've done? So what I would put under the tension division umbrella, you know, it was a big sea change uh, around fall of 2017 where I just changed a lot. At that time, I had already been working with 21 Pilots doing everything, doing Mm. complete art direction, creative direction, all kinds of stuff. So that was a very intimate project, continues to be an intimate project. So I came in at the end of 21 Pilots Vessel album cycle, started doing some merch designs, redid their logo there at the end of that album cycle. And then I had complete creative control visually on Blurry Face. Mm. So that one was an interesting project where Tyler just kind of assumed I was going to do the layout, although I hadn't really done a ton of layouts at the time. And he just kind of assumed I was going to design every single thing. And I certainly could design every single thing. And that was this point of no return moment for me where once I have this singular creative source for all of the stuff that we do, then you're able to create a very cohesive movement out of the whole thing. So we were able to look back at Blurry Face at the end of that album cycle and realize how cohesive and pronounced and bold brand that was. It's perfect. And that was the point of no return for me. So I remember they did this tour to Columbus. They did five shows here in Columbus. You know, they started with a smaller venue all the way to arenas here. And I remember standing outside Nationwide Arena and seeing just the sea of fans all in black and red, right? Blurry face. Everybody's got like, you know, Tyler put this black paint on his hands and on his neck. I was actually at his house when he was like testing that for the first time. <laughs> Be like, should I put it like on my neck and where, you know, and it looks dope. It looked crazy. So it was such a cool thing to watch. Like I was in Tyler's house when he was sitting here and messing with this black paint. And now I see like 300 kids that have the black paint on their neck or on their hands, uh. you know, watching little tiny brand elements. If, I don't know if chosen in a very uh, thoughtful way could then blow up. It almost became this thing of like, you know, if you're looking at a burn pile full of gasoline and you have this match, you know, the match is going to catch fire when you throw it in there. So you just need to make sure you're making the best decisions for something to get so amplified and so explosive. So anyway, blurry face worked really well. And when I was at that nationwide arena, seeing all those fans, I knew I was going to have to figure out a way to repaint this whole fan base. Hmm. And at the time I didn't know what I was going to do, but I actually remember a time when, um, you know, at the very beginning, Tyler was very into yellow. And then I remember I was sitting waiting for my wife outside of a grocery store. And I watched a girl walk out with a army green jacket and a yellow beanie on. And that was just like, yep, that's it. (laughs) That's what it's going to be. So then Tyler added this tape element in and all this stuff. Anyway, all that to say, Trench became this massive visual brand that we're currently in the middle of right now. And both of those, Blurry Face and Trench, made it pretty black and white for me that I was no longer going to have the patience to just be a cog in the machine. I would have to get in on the ground level and control the creative direction internally and create a cohesive brand that will live throughout the duration of the album cycle. I believe if you're that thoughtful with it and if you're that intentional about it, you're just creating a much more robust movement for the fans to take part in. So after seeing that whole Trench brand, it basically made it very clear that if you could create a brand with this much substance, it was going to become a movement that the fan base could participate in and would be kind of life-changing. Mm. So from there, after having done Blurry Face, after having done Trench, after kind of having this track record, I'm good friends with the guys in Under Oath and they were recording a new record in DC at the time. And I got an email or a phone call from their manager saying, hey, the guys want you to design the packaging for their new album, which didn't have a title at the time. And they kind of told me that it was going to be a stylistic shift. It was on a new label, all this stuff. It was going to be a somewhat of a reinvention of Under Oath. And this was the first time I was going to have an opportunity to do a layout for Under Oath. So my business partner, Joel, is also friends with Under Oath. And this seemed like a really good time to say, yes, I want to do this layout and I want Joel involved. Because the other thing about Tension of Vision and its starting point is that it coincided with when my wife was pregnant with our twins and my Mm. twins were born and we were in the NICU for two months. I got to this point where both hands were tied behind my back. And if we were going to be working on a project as massive as this under oath thing, then I was going to have to delegate this work. And Joel and I at the time had been working on a few like 
offshoot projects, a few clothing lines for bands, a few little, we have basically established the fact that Joel and I work together really well. Mm. So it was a natural thing of, I'm so glad I got the opportunity to design this layout. I do not have the time in the day to do all of this. So I get home at midnight. I'm going to design stuff after I get home at midnight, but Joel is going to have to take care of all of the other stuff. So then that forced me to delegate and it forced me to kind of open up my mind to essentially the delegation necessary to run an entire agency. Cause at that point I had just been solo. Mm. So this is a very long winded answer to a list of clients that I have. <laughs> anyway, so we got 21 pilots under oath that led into smashing pumpkins, shiny, no so bright tour which then led into the layout for Shiny No So Bright, the album, Beartooth Disease, AFI, The Missing Man EP, Weezer Black album, Corn, The Nothing, Angels and Airwaves, the new music that they're doing, a band called Too Close to Touch on Epitaph Records, Star Set, which is actually a band from here in Columbus who's pretty phenomenal, massive Love that band. concept, massive story behind that band. They were one of the coolest things that I've seen come up in a while as far as like a concept for a band. Yeah, the concept for Star Set was massive. That was an interesting project because normally I come in and I have, I help them write the story. This was like, there are mountains of story here. So how are you going to clarify this story? How Mm. are you going to try to figure out how to um, articulate it in a way that a broader public can understand all while still catering to the fans that are fully into it? We basically divided the fan base into three groups and those were like the surface fans the mid-level fans and then the super deep fans that will consume anything you put out so that's essentially the list that I, that's in my head i have two bands that we're working on right now i guess the good news is there's enough bands that i think i'm forgetting a few but <laughs> in the past two years that's essentially what the roster's been mm. so those have been very deep relationships with each one of those so the roster is much more of an accurate title mm. than just that list of artists that I used to have for uh, my merch design. I think hearing some of your story so far and hearing how you made the shift from uh, a single person to kind of an agency model now and the vast list of major artists that you've worked with, I think that our our audience has a really good understanding of where you're at right now. I would actually love to hear a little bit of how you made the shift. Before we started this interview, you talked about how you were a specialist first. You were a cog in the machine first. And that's where I'd say a lot of our audience isn't even there yet. They're trying to jump straight to where you are now, which I would almost say a jack of all trades where you're doing the entire process. And a lot of people can resonate with wanting to, to have so much control over the entire process, but they're not ready for it yet. They're trying to jump ahead of everything and just go straight to the top, like where you're at now. What can you say about what you did as a specialist beforehand and, and how you knew it was time to make a shift to the all encompassing, like creative director? So I think that I was a specialist for a lot. Let's see. When I first started, when I'm, I don't know, 16, 17 years old, just kind of trying to figure out what graphic design is. You know, I'm, I have a band and I'm designing flyers and logos for my band. There's other bands in town and I'm designing t-shirt designs and stuff for them. At that point, you're kind of like, whatever the necessity is, you'll do. And I think most people's obsession starts in that way where, you know, I have a nephew who just loves tractors. He's not specialized in a specific part of tractors yet. Dude just knows he likes anything to do with farming and tractors, right? So it starts off very broad. And then the specialization happens after doing it and kind of like dipping your toe into all these different areas and trying to figure out the thing that you're best at. And I think the thing that you're best at should be a very important guide most of the time because the thing that you're best at usually has this built-in motivation to get you out of bed in the morning. You just know you're good at it. You know that you're going to be able to do it and you're going to be able to impress yourself or be happy with what you make. It would be much harder to go out and do a thing that you're just not good at and the only reason you're doing it is try to get better. That isn't nearly as motivating as be like, man, I made that one thing that was really cool yesterday. Let me see if I can make something cool today. So, I just, for whatever reason, t-shirt designs became this very modular need that every band that my band toured with needed. So it became a very simple thing of like, I will design this t-shirt graphic for you. I will send you the file and you will pay me money. And that was a very simple thing at the time. That money was like $40 or free or whatever. The exchange was very simple and it wasn't this ongoing complicated relationship. The stakes were very low. 
All it was was I'll do this, you pay me for that, on to the next one. And I also realized, well, if I could get paid that much for one thing, let me see if I can do more than one thing. How many more of the things can I do and continue to have money? I just started doing the math and realizing if I could figure out a way to do X amount of t-shirt designs every day, then I can make this much money. So that was a very simplistic assembly line introduction into how in the world to make money with graphic design. And real quick, how many bands would you say, how many artists have you worked with ballpark it? 500, 600. I don't know. I think my website back when I had all the other work on my old website, I would assume that list was probably like 250 or something like that. And you know, if I look through my hard drive, I have all the work I've ever done. If I look through my hard drive, it takes a long time to scroll from A to Z. <laughs> and I think, I don't know. I mean, there's probably 10 to 12,000 project folders in that project's archive hard drive. Sure, there's some of it is like My Chemical Romance 2003, My Chemical Romance 2004. You know, they're multiple folders. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I've never counted it, but I would say it's probably, I don't know, man. It might be five, 600 to 1,000 to, I don't know, um, a lot. <laughs> as much as you could possibly imagine doing it. Cause I was never, there was nothing exclusive about it. Mm. You know what I mean? It was just whoever came through, I could do it. I was never, there was never a project I couldn't take. And for most time there was never a project I turned down. I just, mm. a lot of it was this challenge, you know, with it being so modular was like someone would email me to do some stuff and I knew I didn't have time, but I took it on anyway. And then I figured out a way to be super efficient with my work. And then I was able to, figure out how to do it. So I also became very fast at the work. So the speed at with at which I could do this work, you know, coupled with never turning anyone down meant that I could just do tons and tons and tons, which allowed me to figure out a way to make an annual income that I could actually get married. Uh, you know, we moved to Columbus from Dayton and then, um, then I soon bought my first house a year after we got married. And it was all like, I think I've heard the amount of money that adults are supposed to make in a year. <laughs> and let me see if I can make enough money with these little t-shirt designs. Without a boss. Right. To, to see if I can get to that point. Yeah. So the specialization. I think that's what a lot of our listeners are at in their career right now. They are just taking like nickel and dime projects wherever they can, putting it in the assembly line. Sure. And that's kind of like their end goal. If I can make $32,000 a year, then I'm happy right now. That was my number. Was that the number actually? 32,000 was the number. <laughs> there you go. It was. It was like, um, I think adults make $30,000. I didn't want to talk specific numbers, but I think adults make $30,000, right? I don't know. I'm from a small town. There's not a lot of money in my small town. Then I made $32,000 that first year of doing the first full-time year when I wasn't touring. So when I got off the road touring, I was like, I'm going to sit, I'm going to stay here for a year and let's see how many of these t-shirt designs I can add up and make. Thirty thousand dollars. I made thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars that first year. What year was that? Two thousand five. Okay. And then that was me telling myself that okay, that is, you can go back to your um, girlfriend's parents and say you made that amount of money, and then say, so can I ask her to marry her? We've been together since <laughs> we were sixteen. We're twenty-three at the time. Twenty-two at the time. So that was it. I mean, it was a very like mathematical equation for me of is this a viable occupation and um, can I make enough money in a year to do this? Like I said, so mathematical at the beginning. But what it all taught me was, okay, so now I'm a specialist in t-shirt design. I'm like, I don't like doing the web design. Um, at the time, album layout was just way too in-depth. You know, you're going to be like changing thank yous for a band and all this stuff mm -hmm. and like changing liner notes. I don't want to do that stuff. It just seems to scatter my focus and all that stuff. But these t-shirt designs, I can turn these things out you know, I can do a few of them an hour. You know what I'm saying? So like, let me, let me just focus on this. I remember when we first started hanging out, it's wild. Like this is helping me process how long we've been friends and that I've seen your journey from like not a whole lot after the start of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember going over your house and sitting in your studio. It must've been over 10 years ago. It's probably 06. Yeah. Something like that. No, 07, I think. Maybe oh, 08. Dude, that was before we bought our house. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. I remember coming to your place and watching you do a design and it just being like from yeah. concept to finished in like minutes and, and me being like, oh, that's mastery. <laughs> well, what was cool about it was that 
I was able to do doing so much. The byproduct was that you get really fast at everything. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I'm, I don't know the shortcuts that I'm hitting. I don't know all that stuff. I just know that whatever is in my head is getting onto the computer very quickly. The tools are not a barrier, a creative barrier. They're only helping me get my ideas somewhere else. Right. So there's all these other things that are probably happening during that time. I'm getting really fast. You know, I am, I maybe like put a formula to it. What actually works when I do all this stuff, like what gets approved, all that stuff. Like you're, you're, it's almost like a crash course trial by fire turbo boosted experience thing of like when most designers may juggle 10 projects a year, I'm learning how to juggle 10 projects a day and go through and get client feedback and trying to try and anticipate and read their mind and do all that stuff. So I think there's so many un, I, I don't even know that I've listed what I was learning throughout that process, but the specialization kind of taught me so much more stuff because my concern wasn't on what are all the different tasks I could be doing. It was more about, let me just keep doing this one specific thing. And then while I'm doing the one specific thing, I'm going to start learning all of the principles of design in general mm. while doing the one specific thing. So it was like, that task, the t-shirt designs were just the task at hand when I'm learning all the same design principles, all the other designers are doing, but all the other designers are learning them while being very scattered in what it is they're supposed to do today. Mm. There was never a question of motivation. I knew I had to get up and do the thing. Laziness that got out the window early. That was, you know, that had to go right away. So all of those things just had to get out of the way. Cause I knew I had to hit these deadlines every day. And man, it's just amazing how efficient you're going to be when you're anytime you procrastinate something, somehow you get the thing done by the time, mm. right? So essentially without intending to, I was procrastinating everything because I would start the project on the deadline day because it's the only way I could shove all those projects into my calendar. Well, that's due on Tuesday and I've got all kinds of stuff to do on Monday. So it looks like I'm doing the thing on Tuesday. That's due on Tuesday. That's mm. the way it's always going. So that rapid fire work. I think that probably just helped me get all of the skills without really trying to like, okay, I want to get really good at this tool. I don't have time to focus yeah. on a tool. I don't have time to focus on software. I just have to do the work, whichever way my tendencies do. Here's the interesting thing about your story so far. The story is very much in line with Chris's story is very much in line with my story, which was we, we learned how to be very efficient in what we do. And you built up your career just being more and more efficient and putting things out. You're making deadlines. You were probably making more and more money every year. We won't get into the details of that. But Chris and I, our story is the exact same where we started. I made $29,000 my first year uh, working on my parents' basement in my studio. And it went up from there because I got more and more efficient about doing what it, what it is that I do. I started raising my prices and not losing work. And so I, I started doing that more and more. The difference though, between you and Chris and I is that you instead of getting even more efficient and just raising your prices and keeping that same workflow, you completely shifted things to where now you are doing, you, you said you're working with two artists right now. Are there more than that or just two main projects that you're doing right now? Oh no, right now. I mean, we're kind of constantly keeping all of these projects afloat. So in a way you could say I'm working with all of the artists that I just listed there, are, you know, very few, you know, the contract will, run out sometimes or the album cycle will die down. But I mean, for the most part, I would say I am juggling, I don't know, uh, six or seven bands. I didn't include grandson. We work with grandson right now. We work with desk rocks right now. My point with that is six or seven bands. You're doing that right now with your agency where before you might do six or seven bands in a day. <laughs> Right. Yes. And so that's a complete fundamental shift. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing that I'd like to find out more info about you from, because Chris and I, we talk about this all the time on the podcast, how to run your business, exactly how you were running your business, where you are making sure you hit deadlines, you are becoming more efficient, you are optimizing your workflow, you're doing customer relationships, you're managing a bunch of customer relationships and inching up your income year by year. We've beat that to death. What we don't know a whole lot about is how you put these bigger deals together where it is you working with an artist with a very, like a, I would say probably an order of magnitude, much, much larger project overall. How does this sort of stuff come about? Because now you're not just saying, hey, I will send you this deliverable. You pay me this money. Thank you. Goodbye. It's no longer that. Now it is. We have a relationship together. We are building something much, much larger together. And so 
what does that process look like from start to finish? Like someone contacts you at some point and then you go through your, you, I'm sure you have some sort of process set up now. How does that look by, to put some sort of big project like this together at this level? I mean, it's a macro micro type of thing. It's this idea of I was content just being a specialist and just doing these little things here and there. And that was fine because really my goal in life at that time wasn't necessarily to be the best at what I did necessarily. Though you were. <laughs> it was just to try and, you know, support myself and my wife and pay my mortgage and all that stuff. I was just trying to, without going too far into it, a lot of like my parents are still together to this day. And when I was a kid, they argued, but they were only arguing. The core was always about money. So money was always this like infectious thing that kind of like polluted so many areas of my life. And I just see so much that like, if you don't get your money sorted out, if you don't get your financial situation sorted out, it's just going to provide you with so much unnecessary stress, so much that it might even hurt your marriage. Mm. It might hurt all these different make you know, force you to do impulsive, bad decisions, all that stuff. So my quest for financial stability isn't some like, isn't some like, I want to be rich. That's not necessarily what it is. My thing is just, no, money's important because I don't want to have to worry about money. I don't want to wake up knowing I can't pay the bills because it's going to affect everything else. And then you're going to try to talk to me and I'm, and I'm mad, but I'm not mad about this. I'm mad about this global picture that I'm not making enough money. It's an infectious thing. So for me, it was like, I definitely have to get this sorted out. And I know that sounds like it minimalizes it. It's like people would probably roll their eyes at that whole idea, but it's like, you just need to make sure money doesn't become an issue for you every day. You're not angry about money every day. What do you got to do to get to that point? That's what I was trying to do. Um, so what I'm saying now is that I was trying to like make money and do all that stuff. That was the goal of my design. However, every now and then I would find myself walking in the hot topic or walking up to a merch table on a tour or whatever, and just looking up at it all and saying, you know what? I've been working my butt off in the merch industry for all this time and all this merch still sucks. (laughs) It still sucks. Like that. It is so scattered, so inconsistent. I'm not getting any story from these bands. None of these bands are creating a movement because these designs are just churned out by all these different sources, sources that don't know anything about the core story of the artist, all that stuff. It just becomes this scattered, messy thing that all of my time in the merch industry didn't fix. I didn't move the needle. I didn't improve it. So once I started working with 21 Pilots, I started seeing a little bit of a blueprint on how I could improve the overall brand cohesiveness of the music industry in general. And I think not only that, like I said, I think there is a place for it today because with so much attention deficit, um, there just has to be a moment for someone to stop and pay attention. You know what I'm saying? There can be, you know, there's going to be like a hundred cars that are going to drive by the road here. But when that big like parade float with a big dinosaur screaming and blowing flames, we will stop. So there has to be something worthy of our attention, something that can be an immersive experience, something that can be an interactive experience in order for us to actually change this music industry and how branding is approached. Hmm. So I got that in my head. And once I got that in my head, having this vision of doing something bigger in regards to design in the music industry, it got very difficult to go back and churn out those, you know, 10 designs or 10 projects Mm. every day. It was like, okay, I think that this chapter, this phase of my career is over because I can no longer stomach just being a cog in the machine. I think I have to figure out a way to reconfigure the whole machine. One of the things you said earlier that really grabbed me is that Tyler assumed Tyler from 21 pilots assumed that you would do everything. Yeah. That's fascinating. We talk a lot about in the past, and I I talk about this all the time when I'm doing like coaching with somebody or I'm meeting another small business owner and we're hanging out. But this idea that the market will tell you, the market told you what to do next. Well, I'm really lucky to work with an artist that believes in like a grassroots small team because you know, at the very beginning of 21 pilots that whole, and when I guess when 21 pilots was starting to do big tours, 
just about everybody on that tour was a friend, like a school friend or yeah. somebody like that in some way. So he was all about being like, okay, I got Mark Eshelman, video is figured out, right? Now I got Brandon Wright, designs figured out. Very simple for him, right? So that was a tremendous life-changing advantage for me. But he was right. And I think there's something genius about Tyler Joseph that his instincts tend to be prophetic. And mm -hmm. he just has a way of making decisions that are true to him. And then you see that they pay dividends long-term. So Tyler's opinion was that a singular creative source, maybe he didn't say this, a singular creative source would make the brand more cohesive. Hmm. I think that's what was in there. No matter what he said to me, that's kind of what he was realizing. And it did, you know, and him being a singular writer is making the, the music more cohesive or music more honest, all that stuff. So it was just, you know, 21 pilots gave me a taste of something amazing. And, you know, for that transition period, when I was getting out of merch design, what I tended to do at this point, we we're working a lot with 30 seconds to Mars, working a lot with under oath. And we did a line for my chemical romance. There were all these like, there are all these opportunities for, and that's actually how Joel and I started working together. Um, I would not only do a bunch of t-shirt designs, but I would also hand them to Joel. Joel has a lot of experience in corporate clothing line and in that whole world, like Majestic or VF Corporation, all these big real apparel companies, right? So I would hand him like a hundred little graphic things that I did for 30 seconds to Mars. And he would take all this mess of design and try to put it together and into a clothing collection for 30 seconds to Mars. And we did the same thing with under oath. We did the, so it became this thing of these little transitional things of, well, really we only needed, needed to do five t-shirt designs. Why did you create a hundred graphics? And why did we end up doing a collection with 25, 30 garments in it? Right. It was because I can't stand doing just a little piece. anymore. <laughs> and if you ask me to do a little, if you ask me for a piece of candy, I'm going to make you an entire cake. It's just, there's no way around it right now, you know? So what, and I started finding myself way more creatively fulfilled if I could not give myself the stopping point that I used to have, which went against a lot of my instincts and going back to what you and I, you know, had always talked about. You know, I think you introduced me to the idea of Tim Ferriss. I say the idea is the actual human being. But he's also <laughs> an idea. The institution of Tim Ferriss. The philosophy of Tim Ferriss. Yeah, you introduced me to Tim Ferriss. Um, introduced me to E-Myth. All these different things. And it got very clear, though, that as much as you and I talked about business, this idea of a business that can run without you, well, I just wasn't a great candidate for that. Because we could hardly find time to get lunch, yeah. let alone... Uh figure out a way for me to walk away from my business and the business still runs. I was a sole proprietor. I'm all by myself. There's, I can't delegate, you know, I tried to delegate a few projects here and there and it just didn't work the way it was. So again, it was probably some divine intervention when having the kids yeah. and I'm in a hospital for two months. Obviously this is way more important than anything I would ever do with design. I am here. Nothing else matters. I don't care if I go broke for the next two months sitting in this hospital. But that under oath project came through and I said, well, Joel, this is it. This is the first time I'm going to really be able to delegate a project. So can you handle all the managerial stuff and I can try to come in and be a technician after midnight and actually design the things. And that's what we did. And essentially that was how the layout for under oath did. And, you know, Joel's spending the day talking to the band, talking to the manager, talking to the label, all that stuff. And I'm doing the design work. So we created this somewhat of a visionary integrator role, me being the visionary, Joel being the integrator. So Joel, you know, is running the day to day of the business. Joel is in touch with the clients every day and it allows me to think of the bigger vision and also to be the main lead designer day to day and come up mm. with the core concepts that are hopefully based on the core story and kind of get much deeper and much more emotional about it than I would say most designers tend to get. I'm, um, I'm an emotional dude, yeah. so I want to <laughs> break it down to the core of why you feel the way you feel uh, very that. quickly. Well, you said a couple of things there that I think are, are interesting. We talk about on the podcast, I always make this joke about how I was a loser. I was terrible at business. And then I met my son hmm. and it was like this, you know, the joke I always make with everybody is it was this moment of like transformer, like I must provide. Yes. Like, I'm going to figure this business thing out. 
I love this little guy. And like, I remember the moment when like they were weighing him at the hospital at St. Anne's and I said something to my wife and I was like kind of holding his head up while they weighed him. And he looked over when he heard my voice and our eyes met. And it was like in that moment where I was like, oh man, it's about ready to get crazy in here. I'm going to have my business running like crazy in a minute. And it is so counterintuitive yeah. how the thing that is going to take up the most time ever and is going to be the most dis- distracting is not the right word because they are the thing. Yeah. But the most consuming ends up being the most effective motivator yeah. for clarifying your business because there's no time to be scattered anymore. You have no choice but to clarify what it is your business yeah. does. Your ego kind of flies out the window right. because now your life is service. Right. It's and, protection. And your business is no longer the most important thing in your life. Yes. So once the thing gets demoted to not the most important thing in your life, it gets much easier to delegate. Woo! Oh man. That that's man, some good if stuff. we could do a if we could do a podcast, I mean maybe this is it, but like the conversation of how kids becoming a new parent affects business oh man it is like it because it's so unsaid if you don't have kids you there's no way you can know and there's no judgment if you don't have kids and you don't know that stuff yet but it is just such a it's almost like the mike tyson quote of everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth yep. and then once you get <laughs> punched in the mouth then um there's all the BS goes out the window. Like it's just clarity of vision, clarity of intention. Yeah. And then your decisions just become way more like, I don't know, you get less time to frolic around in the field and you actually have to get down to business. One of the things that I found with that is, you know, before kids, somebody would come back with a revision and be like, Oh, could you do this? And I would be like, I know, man, what, what did you say? Are you doubting my abilities as a, you know, and I would just get so offended. But then once I had kids, it was like, okay, well, I'm going to make this person happy. I'm going to, I'm going to make this artist pumped about my work and I'm going to be chipper about it. Yeah. I need to provide, I need to put food on the table. And then it was the weirdest thing of like, I started working with clients in that way. I was so much less offendable. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it it was like, Hey, this is pretty fun to treat people the way I want to be treated and to not take everything so personally that like, you're not the great, that I'm not the greatest technician of all time. Okay. So what I think when you say that is, you know, for my kids, I wake my kids up in the morning and most of the time, well, my daughter definitely, when she's, she's going to listen to this like 10 years from now and be embarrassed. <laughs> when I wake my daughter up, she's got a poopy diaper. <laughs> every morning. Right. So I'm changing that diaper right away. And also usually when I get it, my, my son's as cool as can be in the morning. He's just, you know, I, everything's cool. He's chill. No big deal. I pick him up. I change him. I take him down. I get him dressed. I take him downstairs and then I come back up and then I get my daughter out. Well, my daughter will be losing it every time I take her out of her crib. Mm-hmm. She just wants to stay in the crib and like, keeps just kind of like play in there. Right. So when I'm taking her out of the crib, she loses it. She flails around. She does the worst thing you would want a baby to do while you're trying to change them, especially with a poop diaper. If they're, oh boy. if they're flailing around, it's awful, right? They're, they're reaching. So what's happening as a father is you have this thing being completely irrational and insane. And we know as dads, it is not going to do any good for us to react and yell and scream and lash out back at that type of energy. So we just have to sit here and take it. We might be getting punched in the face. We might be able to getting kicked in the groin, whatever's happening to us as dads, we still have to learn to keep our composure (laughs) throughout the chaos. Right? (laughs) Yeah. So in the same way, it's like you're getting this training on how to not be so impulsive in your reaction Mm -hmm. and also think of the greater good because the greater good for my kids is to not think that dad's a monster and to be terrified of dad. Right. I do not want my kids to be scared of me. I want them to respect me and know that I can discipline them, but I don't want them to actually truly be so scared of me. They don't want to talk to me or be around me. There's a big delineation there. So in the same way, it's not all about my ego when it comes to clients. It's not only about like, you don't talk to me that way. <laughs> like that's got to go out the window and you got to find some common ground. You also have to put yourself in their perspective. Me being in a band, knowing that, no, this is my band. I know the way I want to be perceived. I know what I want to say. And there's not too many designers are going to be able to come in 
and trump what I'm trying to say, right? Mm -hmm. So it is very much a work together relationship. And I don't know if I knew that when I first started the agency. I don't know if I knew that two and a half years ago or whatever it was. But I know that now, and it makes it a little bit more difficult. It's probably not as concise as it was back then where I got spoiled by my first clients. But I think that there's some balance that sometimes your clients are going to want you to do things that may not be your tendency. But I also believe that if you can allow those clients to stretch you a tad, you might access areas that you never want to access. It would be like Willie Nelson coming in and really wanting you to just track that awful acoustic guitar that he has. When you know that it, you have a tried and true acoustic guitar that will get you exactly the sound that you want, it becomes a signal that you can predict. That Willie Nelson's guitar with a hole in it, you don't know what type of vibration is going to come back out of that thing, and you don't know how you're going to be able to control that thing you know, in production. Yeah, so that's it, awesome. It's this thing of like, but you're Willie Nelson, and that guitar has a soul, and I'm going to figure out a way to make that work. And maybe at the end of this, you get a Grammy on that song because yeah. it has the most warm or weird tone that you've ever heard, right? So I believe don't shut your client down without the ability to understand that wherever they want to take, you may stretch your need a little bit. Which brings me to an interesting hypothetical question. If you had been like the traditional, like play by the rules, like type of guy, which you are not, you are a make your own path type of guy. If Tyler had come to you, Tyler Joseph from 21 Pilots and, and had essentially communicated, we want you to be the creative director. What would have happened if you responded and said, well, um, actually, that's not how things are done in the music industry. Because this is before they exploded. This is before yeah. Blurry Face. This and was thing. 2012. Yeah. So if you had come back and been like, actually, we're going to need um, a layout designer because I don't do that. And yeah, actually, you're right if you had responded in a way where you had sort of rejected this sort of outlandish thing that he wanted, what would, well, what would I have think, happened? I think there's a built in humility to building the blueprint because mm. if you're trying to build the blueprint, you're also kind of realizing you don't know, you don't know the path. And I think that's one thing that's really cool about the music industry right now. Nobody knows. We don't know. Every marketing plan is different. Every new idea is different. We're all just attempting new things because the market changes so quickly. TikTok wasn't a thing two days ago. You know what I'm saying? But TikTok <laughs> is a thing now. So, and now TikTok also becomes this marketing tool. And it's very possible in a few years when someone's listening to this, someone's going to laugh because I'm talking about TikTok because it's disappeared or something, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be these new mediums and this new, these new types of content. So it's a very Wild West moment in the music industry. And I say moment, it's not. It's just a Wild West era where we have no idea what works. Tyler didn't know exactly what would work. So he had to stick to his instincts and just try. So he knew that we were both trying to create the thing. So we kind of had a mutual respect of this is my best guess at how to do this. Hmm. And here's your best guess at how to do this. Let's just stay true to ourselves because we both know there's no guidebook. So when it comes to tension division as a whole agency, we are very much writing a blueprint that we have no idea what's next. I feel like every week I talk to my business partner, Joel, about some new type of arm or bolt on that we have to do to this agency that, we, you know, there's roles that are needed that we need to figure out because we're starting to see too, like labels are dying. Well, not, they're not dying. Labels are always probably going to have the most money, at least for the foreseeable future. And that's the label's greatest strength is their deep pockets, right? Mm. But um, other mm. than the deep pockets that the label has, access to millions of dollars, the artist development needs, especially an art department or marketing, or all that stuff, a lot of that stuff could probably be done a la carte. So in that way, this idea of some artist development entity heavily invested in branding, which, you know, I just start seeing all the different areas that branding bleeds out into and it makes me interested on whatever the new team a band needs to have to succeed. I love that. Right now, record labels is still very much a part of that. But, you know, there's certainly a way if the reason you're getting signed isn't for some massive signing bonus or isn't for some massive distribution manufacturing deal, which, of course, why do we care about distribution manufacturing? You know, I personally love a printed piece of packaging because I am who I am. But I also realize it's, you know, of all the bands that I listen to, I don't know how many of those bands I have anything physical from, right? So 
this artist development or whatever this team that an artist must have, it is changing day to day. And I'm seeing so many artists that are able to pull it off without a label, or at least there's a path that doesn't require a label. Um, so I am extremely interested in what exactly that puzzle piece is. And branding covers a lot more of those check boxes than I think people realize. Well, let's talk about branding. I was talking to Allison, my wife last night and we, Oh, Allison, I know Allison. Oh yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> so we're hanging out and my daughter and Nora were, were like sitting on oh, the bed. Oh, Nora, I know. I know Nora. <laughs> we're sitting on the bed and Nora runs in and brings me a piece of her Halloween candy. Mm -hmm. And it's like a Hershey bar that glows in the dark. Like the, mm. the label glows in the dark. And, I, and she's like, I want you to have this, dad. And I was, <laughs> like, I was like, I don't I don't like Hershey bars. And so she runs in the other room and comes back and brings me a Twix. Or no, no, she brought me a, a Kit Kat. Mm. And I'm looking at the Kit Kat and it just sort of hit me that candy sort of nails branding better than any other industry because it makes a promise. When I'm sitting there holding a single Kid Cat in a wrapper. It's Kit Cat, not Kit. Kid Cat. Oh gosh, you're right. It's Kit Cat. When I'm holding my Kit Cat, <laughs> I know when I open it up exactly what to expect. And I know when I take a bite of it exactly what it's going to taste like. And Kit Cat <laughs> is, is interesting because they make a promise. Their brand is a promise of you're going to get what you expect you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And so you know more about branding. I was telling Allison this this morning. I was like, Brandon knows more about branding than anybody I know. And I know that no amount of books I could read is ever going to get me to Brandon's magical ability to understand it, like what branding is. So tell us more about that. What's branding? It's funny that you say it because I think when I was 30 years old, I went to, I'm 36 now, I went to a creative conference called Creative Works put on by my friend Josh. And this guy, Jesse Bryan, did a, did a talk there. Mm. And and this agency is called Belief Agency in Seattle. They clarified branding for me in the most concise way. And that was the, you know, I had been doing design since I was 16 years old or whatever it was. And it wasn't until I was age 30 that I truly understood what branding was. So what Jesse said is the greatest brand to ever exist is the United States of America. Ooh. And we all kind of are unified. We're all part of that brand. And, you know, when I would hear Jesse speak, he would say United States of America, which made sense to me. But I started taking it as, you know, Christianity as a brand. It's a powerful brand because here we are in Columbus, Ohio, and we can go into your traditional all-American Christian household in Columbus, Ohio, and there might be some needlepoint that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord <laughs> or whatever, right? A Bible or whatever. There, there's just a vibe to it. And if we went to Nashville, Tennessee, we would find a household with the same vibe. We went to Denver, Colorado, we find the same vibe, right? Regionally, it does change a little bit. But overall, what I'm saying is that a brand is very much a movement where we are all unified under a similar belief system. And that is how to sort of run the brand and keep the brand cohesive so that when someone interacts with our brand, it becomes something familiar and reliable the same way a Kit Kat is for mm. you. So one of the good examples of this is I think in the E-Myth, he talks about, he goes into the barbershop, best haircut he ever got. And I'll, I'll change the story a little bit just to make my point. Let's say you go into a barbershop. Um, a guy comes out, he says, uh, he says, how are you doing today, sir? What could I do for you? He says all the same things, right? He puts the cape on you the same way. He smells the same. All that stuff is the same. It's reliable. There's old timey music on the radio, right? It feels there is a vibe. There is a moment. There is an experience that's happening there, albeit very casual and simple. And then he comes and best haircut he ever had. The guy even gave him a mint right when he left, right? It's perfect. He comes in the next time perfect. All of those things happen again. And then he comes in another time, you know, maybe let's say he's been going for a year. Then he comes in another time and there's a different guy. And the guy says, um, do you want a haircut? What kind of haircut? You, yeah, cause I only got a few minutes. Like if, you know, and he gives him a haircut, haircuts, not that good. There's definitely no mint. The guy smells different. There's the, the guy's playing different music on the radio. 
And the guys never wanted to go back to that barbershop because what happened is we created this brand equity. We created this trust between I will deliver for you. I will care about your needs and I will provide for those needs and I will deliver every time. Chris and I are very lucky to live in Columbus with a restaurant called North Star Cafe. Amen. <laughs> talking about it so there's, damn much. Is it really four, that good? It's great. It's great for all the reasons I'm about to explain. There's probably four or five of them in town. Every employee, they'll probably just be wearing an earth tone t-shirt most of the time. I think all the employees are very pleasant. It's not about you have to be attractive. It's you just be clean and be pleasant and be somewhat there, but not there. Right. Yeah. And totally. so they're always incredibly nice. They're incredibly giving. They'll give you a, you know, if they mess anything up, you're getting a free meal. If, um, they didn't bring something there, there's never, ever going to be a haggling of why is this on my check or whatever? You know, it's none of that. It is almost like all of the complications of a restaurant experience have been removed. They have identified all of the things that make someone not like the restaurant and they have stripped it down to, we have great service. We are nice. We are not going to bother you. We are going to give you great food and you are going to enjoy the atmosphere while you're mm. here. There's so many things that are going on that somewhere back behind the scenes, they're being very intentional about it. But for us, we just know that the experience that we had the first time at North Star 10 years ago is very similar to the yeah. experience we had last week. They have delivered on this thing over and over again. This Or yesterday morning in my case. Right. So, <laughs> And there's a reason we keep going. And the menu has like, what, 20 items on it? It's a very small yeah. menu, but we know what we're going to expect. And that food is that good every single time. So I would say branding. I mean, and I don't, I'm sure Jesse Bryan probably has a more concise definition. And I've never really rehearsed a definition of branding. But I think branding really relies on deeply understanding what it is that this company needs to say, deeply understanding who it is that they're saying it to, and removing all of the barriers of communication between those two entities. So if you can do that and you can be intentional enough about that, and really when I say what the business is about, I'm talking about stripping everything down to the actual truth. And I think the actual truth behind why someone does something is so powerful, right or wrong, is so powerful. Let's take Mark Zuckerberg. He was trying to get back at an ex-girlfriend, right? Like there was something so powerful and intense about the core motivator behind why it is you do what you do, what the actual truth is, that that truth is so powerful that it is sustainable. Mm. It's not really going to waver. It's like being caught in a lie and all these you know, contrasting stories. It's going to be a mess. You can't keep a lie up. You just can't. So in the same way that you can't keep a lie up, you can't keep a brand going that doesn't know what it is that it had, didn't know the truth from the beginning. So the bands that we have the most problem with are the bands that have no clue who they are, why they do what they do, you know, some bands, they just play and they get successful and they never really know why. And those bands tend to be the most scattered as far as a brand perspective goes. But you take someone like Tyler Joseph and 21 Pilots, that dude knows exactly what it is that he's saying. Hmm. And I think that's why his brand is so cohesive. And I've been lucky enough to be a part of it and to try and extract and articulate what it is that he's trying to say throughout the mediums that I work in. Hmm. So I know what he's saying and his truth hasn't changed. He has maintained his story the whole way through. So in the same way, the brand has stayed strong and cohesive. And we also have a lot of fans that, you know, 21 Pilots has changed their life. So it gets really hard to lie to a fan base mm. as dedicated as 21 Pilots are. So you have to be honest. You have to respect your fan base. You have to respect what it is that your public wants. And North Star knows what we want and they have provided for us. Yeah. And, you know, there was a time where Apple knew what I wanted and would provide for me all the time. And we can tell that something has changed. Yep. Not necessarily Tim Cook's fault. We don't know. It's had its time. Apple was knocking it out of the park for us at a certain time. And it... Now they sell credit cards. Now they sell credit cards. But <laughs> it, it gave us a time where that brand helped us define who we are. If you would come into my house in 2005, and you saw all Apple computers, 
you would have an assumption about who I was, right? And I did, and I did. <laughs> well, so <laughs> Apple was this element that helped define my own personality, and that was powerful. Hmm. And I think, you know, you, you know, obviously we, we live in uh, Columbus, Ohio, so there's Ohio State stuff everywhere. For a lot of people, that Ohio State brand represents who they are. Mm. I would argue that I wish you had more depth than just a sports team, but that is what <laughs> that is what identifies people. At least there's something that they can get excited about. Yeah. And I appreciate that. So I, I always look for those things like Coca-Cola or Apple or Ohio State or Christianity or America or, you know, sport teams are a great example of of brands doing something. You know, yeah. you take someone like the Philadelphia Eagles, right? They're always kind of a they're always, I don't know, there's like a grit to them, right? And then yep. there's kind of a preppiness to the New England Patriots. You know what I'm saying? And then I'm more of an NBA fan, so but I would say sports teams are the best sample size of what a brand actually is. Mm. It says something about you. You know, like if you're a Mets fan or a uh, Cubs fan or a Clippers fan, Clippers are good now, but those say something about your identity. You're going to still like the Mets and the Cubs and yeah. whatever it is, you know? So a brand, if done well, will help someone identify their own, you know, their own self. That's fascinating to me because I think about the work you've done with 21 Pilots and I think about 21 Pilots as a band and maybe I'm a little too close to them, but I don't think of them. Oh yeah, they do that one song. There's something bigger about, they're a scene in and of themselves. Is there a scene? But you think about a lot of other bands, One Hit Wonders, oh, they did that song but there was no story. There was no vibe. There was nothing bigger than that. But you look at a band like the Grateful Dead or you look at a band like, uh, let's see who else. No, here. Grateful Dead and Fish are a perfect example. Yes. Dave Matthews band. Yes, <laughs> yes. So those are all bands where like, no, if, if you see the Dave Matthews dancer thing on the back of someone's car, you can make assumptions about who they are. You can make assumptions about the Fish fans and the Grateful Dead fans. 21 Pilots is becoming something like that. Yeah. My Chemical Romance was something like that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So when we talk about the 21 Pilots brand, the only comparables we usually use are stuff like Grateful Dead and Fish because hmm. that's where we're headed. That's what we want it to be. And, you know, Pearl Jam is another cult following band where there might be a point where 21 Pilots doesn't have anything on the radio, but they're still selling out the arena. So become hmm. Tool is another example of this. Tool is a great example yeah. of this. Insane Clown Posse. Insane Clown Posse is perfect. Yeah. So these are these other brands where these fans are using the band to identify who they are. And mm. today, when we talk about things like bullying, we talk about things like self-image, um, LBGTQ communities, all that stuff. Like, I think people are searching very much for some clarity in who it is that they are. And if they can get that clarity and get that understanding of themselves, it gives them way more self-confidence and makes better people. You're blowing my <laughs> mind, man. How can you take this sort of like great definition of branding though and apply it to a business? Because it is, it's one thing to identify with like something that is a huge movement or a big name or a big brand, but to have like a micro brand for your business, that's something that's a little bit less clear to me. And, and I feel like there's something there with that though, that we, we all can take something away from this and apply to our own brands to where it's cohesive. People can identify with it. If they work with us, there's something about that client that is said just because they're associated with us. What can we do to our businesses to really rein that sort of thing into our brands? I think every brand has to have a mission statement. And I think it's fine that if you're, if you bake pies, that your mission statement can be super intense and way too heavy for just pies. Like, I probably will always go the route of being way more intense than people would expect. Actually, recently we're working on a record label. We're actually branding a record label from the ground level. And when I started talking to those guys on the phone, I got really in depth with how I approach branding and talking about a movement with all this stuff. And at first they were like, what are you talking about this stuff for? We're talking about a record label. And I'm like, this, this applies across the board. You have to have clarity in why it is you do what you do, even if it's running a business. Sure, band, it's a little bit more like the heart is on the sleeve, but I hope that there's just as much heart and intention behind a business because I think that those business values will translate to people wanting to work with you just on the base level, but also you having clarity on why it is you do what you do mm -hmm. and clarity and some moral compass on the right decision to make, right? If the only goal of a business is to make money, 
I have a feeling that that business is going to make a series of impulsive bad decisions. And I think that that business will tend to only see a point A and a point B, whereas, um, and they will do whatever, they'll jump over anyone, kick anyone, create all kinds of destruction just to get to point B Mm. where I would then look at that business as as you tried so hard to get to point B that you like left a disaster in your path and you screwed up so many other things. So there's nothing, there's nothing internally wholesome about what your business is because you're just going to continue to make the impulsive decisions. And I see so many businesses Mm. fail because there isn't any robust intentional holistic growth. And I know those are all just very abstract images that don't, that don't translate very well. I would say for us as a business, just I'll be very specific. I feel like if we can create this type of thinking for each band that we work with, it's going to become very tempting for other bands to also have that bands will soon believe that they're not going to be able to be as powerful if they don't have a branding team behind them. Mm. It's going to become undeniable it's almost saying like, you know, recording to tape or and seeing like, oh, well, if we could digitally record this, we would have much more. I don't know if that's a good example. I'm I'm talking to the wrong wrong audience to use that <laughs> as an example. Well, actually, if you have a analog tape system, anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry, nerds. Uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that there's going to be a new way of doing things. And for us, I hope the new way of doing thing is actually way more wholesome and way more robust and way more deep than the way we've done it before. I'm saying I'm against impulse. Mm. I'm saying that we need to know who we are and go be it as opposed to chase the next carrot because those carrots are going to change and that content is going to change all that stuff. How do we navigate this landscape when we know that all of the targets continue to move? There is never anything stationary. So the only way we can make the best decisions is know who we are and not be so obsessed with whatever the next impulsive choice we have to make is. So that goes for my business, but that also goes for the bands that we work with. And I hope other people see what the bands that we work with have in contrast to what the bands without us Mm. do. That's so good, man. But when it comes to tension of vision and our mission statement, it's very heavy. It it probably sounds like hardcore lyrics or something. You know what I mean? Like it's all, you know, like we didn't mention this before. You used to be the lead singer of a band called dead poetic. Right. So, so our lyrics tended to be very dark and very um, abstract and intense and all that stuff. And I think that that's just the approach that I make with Mm. just about everything that I do. Well, let's talk a little bit more. I'm going to be selfish here and apply some of the stuff that you've talked about uh, to Brian and I. Uh, you know, we've got this podcast. You guys that are listening have some ideas about who we are and what our brand is. And, you know, man, Brian, I guess this is probably something we should talk more about. But I think we inadvertently, some of the success of this podcast has been because of branding, because we don't talk about gear. And if you do, you get the gear slut alert. And like that's that's different. That sets us apart from anybody else out there. And we talk about you know business exclusively. I think making that promise and keeping it and being clear about what our mission is. You know, we know what who we are, but I guess we haven't been terribly clear about what our mission statement is. I think that's okay. I think it defines itself as you go. We didn't know. I mean, I think starting a business is reactive. You have to be reactive. Mm. But there's also going to be this turning point when you realize that you're being reactive, but there's some wisdom that you have that others don't have. Mm -hmm. And it would probably do you best to lean into that wisdom and be confident in that wisdom without saying everyone else is wrong. You know, there's still a way to be like, I believe in this path that I'm on. And that's certainly true for me. I believe in the path that we're on. I believe in the way that we're doing it. I can see other successful entities and know that I don't want to do it any like they do it at all. I'm just as sure about what I want to be as I am about what I don't want to be. And just because a business is successful, sure, I can you know take a few looks at it, but I also believe in I'm going to have my own unique approach to the way that I want to do my business. And that's powerful. And, and that I have to believe that if I can stick to that, then I will possibly be able to create a business that has never existed before. And maybe that's also a different thing because maybe a lot of people are searching for 
careers that are exactly like someone else's career, which is totally fine. And I think that in most corporate environments, that's probably the case. But in my case, I am trying to write a blueprint for a role in the music industry that hasn't previously existed. Hmm. So if that's the case, I much more have to like go with my gut as much as I can and go with whatever mission statement it is that I have and being honest about what my, what my true purpose is and sticking to that as opposed to trying to just like copy something else that I've seen. Very rarely has copying someone else's approach ever really worked for me because I think that my main motivation comes from me truly being honest about what it is that I am and what it is that I want. Mm. That's a huge core value for this podcast. I think you put it better than we have with this idea of creating a job description that's never existed before in this wild west era of the music industry. Now's the time. Yeah. Your best bet is to create a job description that's never existed before. Yep. Amen. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dude, I love uh, when you were, this is like mid 2000s, you kind of had this concept you shared with me called Dark Collar. Yeah. That was the name I gave my little freelance operation. Yeah. I, I love how you explained this. And I think this is something I think about this all the time. Cool. But this idea of like, you've got white collar. We've talked about white collar and, and blue collar in the past. Mm -hmm. White collar is like, you know, your corporate job. You wear a white shirt with a white collar. Probably got a degree. Probably got a degree. Blue collar is you like more technical, you know, more like salt of the earth. Get dirty, work with your hands. Get dirty, work with your hands. You wear clothes that probably have a blue collar. And your business name before Tension Division was Dark Collar. And it was, this, it's not either of these things. It's, it's not either. It's, it's this different thing. Yeah. Apples and oranges thing. Yeah. And it's this like, we don't have bosses we make a living based on our own creativity and don't tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. Is that kind of what 21 pilots had when they, they painted their necks black with the dark color? That was really a representative of whatever the enemy is, whatever it is that is pulling you away from what you're trying to be. It was a representative huh. of some force that was holding them back. So there's something very constrictive about it. Well, either way, I love the term dark color. It's like, it still represents, it sums up, our kind of path in life compared to white and blue collar. Right. Yeah. It's just something in between some middle thing. And yeah, that was the name that I, I mean, I came up with that name a lot. I think I was 18 when I came up with that name, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's the only thing that has made sense to me. I think when I was a kid, my dad, he first had this job where he was like loading freight onto commercial airplanes in Dayton and they would move his hours around. He was working second shift. Then he was working third shift. When he was working third shift, he was just working all the time or sleeping. And I was never able to like see him that much because work was just, you know, stretching him every which way and just really like stretching him thin. And there was a point where he had enough and he started his own company, his own lawn care company. And so he worked for himself. He did things the way he thought they should be done. And then I had another uncle who was also what I would view as well off and he had his own construction company. So it became very clear at a young age that you can't work for anybody if you want to have any control over mm. the type of life that you want. So that was kind of cemented in. The problem was ever since I was three or four years old, I would just knew that I wanted to be an artist when I grew up, right? That mm. was the only, if my mom would ask me, what do I want to be when I grow up? Artist is all, the only answer I have ever had for that question. So working for yourself, being an artist, all I could think of was some starving artist, fine artist person who never made any money. So I had no clue how in the world I would be able to make money with my art. Would I, what, am I going to draw comic strips? Am I going to draw cartoons? I don't know how in the world to do this. And even when I was in high school, I started going to college for my junior and senior year, a post-secondary thing. And I would start taking art classes at a community college nearby. I got into fine art because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. So I'm drawing charcoal drawings and drawing still life stuff and all that. And then this guy comes into that class. He comes in with this toolbox. It has markers and exacto knives and all this stuff in it. And he said, yeah, um, I do the graphic design program upstairs. Graphic design. And I'm 17 years old, mm. which is crazy. Cause you think I'd know about it before then. So graphic design is the thing that I've been doing when I make these flyers for my band and all that stuff. Got it. Okay, I'm going to stop doing all these fine art and go upstairs and do this design department thing and start taking these typography and 2D design courses, all that stuff. So it's always been this like 
discovery of whatever this career is. There is no blueprint. I was a big fan of this design agency called Asterix Studio, and they worked in the music industry doing stuff, and I really liked what they did. That was an exciting moment for me to see something that happened. But as much as I love them, I knew that the way I wanted to do it would be different from them. So it's always been this make your own path type of thing that is kind of customized to what I am most passionate about. And I can't assume that the majority is most passionate about the things that I'm passionate about. Mm. So it is very much about, you know, when we get back to specialization, specialization is powerful because you get to become really, really good at one thing. And that one thing is held in high value by other people. And don't be afraid of being one really good at one thing. I would argue being really good at one thing is way more powerful than being okay at all the other things. Yeah. And being okay at all the other things is a totally reasonable starting point, but it's okay to lean into the thing that you find your focus always going back to. You know, even if it's something as silly as like comping vocals or something like that, like, man, that dude's really good at comping vocals. Like maybe he's just our guy. Every time we need to have vocals comped, he's going to be able to handle that. Or man, that guy is really good at, uh, again, I I don't want to like step into audio world and I don't know. You're killing it right now. You are so on topic. It's not even funny. Right. But you would rather have that. No, don't have, don't have that guy put the microphones in on that drum kit. Like Mm. have have dude put the, you know, cause he's, he'll be way better at it or whatever. Making all of those engineering decisions, making all that stuff. Like it's okay to be a specialist in that stuff. It's okay to like really just lean into all that because I have a feeling the power of getting really good at one thing is probably going to supply you with enough confidence to jump into the much bigger other mm. thing. As opposed to saying, I'm okay at a whole bunch of things. Therefore, I don't have enough confidence to go to the next step because I'm not great at any one thing. It's okay to figure out a way to be great at one thing. You don't have to know how to do all of it. There's plenty of areas of design and branding that I don't want to touch. And I have a business partner that that we, de- you know, I delegate a lot of stuff to. There's all kinds of things that he does that I do not want to do. And I think that was another big light bulb moment for you and I when we're talking about business. There are people out there who want to do the stuff that you hate to do. And if you can find those right puzzle pieces, you can put your own little agency together. So with that said, I know we were talking before about like the makeup of my agency, you know, Joel and I are partners in it, but then we also have three other designers under us. And we also have a guy who works on our business deals, kind of a broker type of thing to get new, new business. Um, We have an accounting guy. We could probably, hire a project manager soon, but right now Joel is effectively the project manager. So Joel becomes the business operations guy that kind of is handling everything. And then I handle pretty much all the creative and design wing of the whole entire thing. So I very much am still getting my hands dirty designing all this stuff, but I'm also learning to delegate that design work to three designers that I have under me. And I think maybe having the agency having this new ability to delegate and also caring more about the welfare of the business than the specific welfare of myself is a powerful thing. I want tension division to succeed, whether they know Brandon Reich is a part of it or not. This is all getting me closer to creating this business that can run without me. Because really at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out how to integrate my values and my approach and my systems to this team underneath me where Is there any way you can get close to thinking the way that I think for these projects and to extract this story and this truth from these bands the way that I do? And slowly over time, I hope that our team, whoever that is on the team, can start learning how to do that so that I could have them take those calls with those artists Mm. and come back to me with, this is the story of this artist. This is what they stand for. You'll do it. And we can, we can build that brand. But in the meantime, I'm getting a lot more time to spend with my kids and I'm getting, I wouldn't call it free time, but I'm getting a little bit of air for the first time Mm. in a long time. And that's really, we get to get lunch sometimes. Yeah. We were getting lunch a little bit more now. And (laughs) you can see that because I've pretty much, you know, from, I don't know, 2007 to 2017, I was working as much as I could possibly work all the time and it was all consuming and I'm glad I had that time. Mm. But at this time, I think I'm ready to 
pass the torch and whatever it is that I know down to a bigger agency and I want that agency to succeed. And that's probably something that can run up until I'm 60 years old. You know, the agency can, can continue doing it. I'm not going to say that I'm going to be on the edge of cutting edge graphic design when I'm 60 years old, but I really hope that I'll have an agency that employs people who are on the cutting edge mm. of it, you know, at that time. Man, Brandon, your life is like a business book. Thanks, man. It really is, man. <laughs> well, we've read a lot. You know, yeah. I think that uh, just about all of our business books we share, like we're, we're both going through the same things. Yeah. And we're always trying to hack this system or strip it down to its core elements. So, yeah, I think that uh, you may be the biggest influence on my business decisions, Chris <laughs> Graham. You heard it here, guys. I love you, brother. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it is, it's been a blast to see you grow it and figure it out and man, it is such a, it's an honor to call you a friend, man. Thanks, man. Likewise. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I'm at the top of any mountain though. I still very much feel like I'm trying to figure it out. But what I have now that I didn't use to, there's not this unknown. Like I think I know it's probably going to work out mm. because I think that my foundations are pure. I'm not doing this for any like any reasons other than the best reasons one could do this for, I think. I love so that. So I know that I think it's going to be just fine. And I also, it's like curling at this point. It's like the Canadian <laughs> Olympic sport curling where you've really got to do everything you can to just send it off in the right direction. There's going to be a little bit of time to course correct, but for the most part, like if you feel like your initial send off, I'm sure curlers have a name for when they send the thing out, but your initial push, your initial sending it out I'm confident with what we've done as far as sending this company out into the music industry. Mm. And there's a little bit of course correction that's going to happen, but overall I know why we're doing what we're doing and it's not for very selfish indulgent reasons or impulsive reasons. We're doing this because we actually want to improve the brands for these bands in the music industry because we actually believe they can change the lives of their fan base. I love Truly. That. I don't know if you remember this from the Emeth Revisited, but what you're describing is what you read in the Emeth all those years ago. He goes on to say that a mature business is born mature. Yeah. Yeah. You have to start it with being mature in mind. To take an immature business and convert it to a mature business yep. is really, really, really hard. And when I say your life is like a business book, like there is that part of the Emeth Revisited where it says... You know, you have to start with maturity in mind. Yeah. And maturity means it's scalable, which means it can grow. You can bring other people in on your team. You can create systems. You can provide, you can do what you can do as a solo person on a much larger scale and make a bigger impact on the world. And that's what you're doing, man. You, you are the top shelf redefining how bands tell stories, how they use merch to do that, how they use graphic design to do that. And it's wild, man. It's wild to see that baby being born. Thanks, man. I mean, like, I think that in regards to the maturity, I wouldn't have had the maturity had I didn't go through all those years of specialization. Mm, totally. You know, I got my machine working really well, you know what I mean, all, throughout all of that time. But I've been thinking a lot, and I don't know if we started talking about this um, a week or two ago, but I've been thinking like on a, I don't want to be sexist to say a man's life because that's probably not completely accurate, but let's just say for the sake of this argument, in a man's life, married man's life, whatever, I think there's a Venn diagram with three circles, right? One circle is ego. The other circle is money. And the other circle is family. And I've realized that all three of these things need to be met. And I think what happens is when we start a business, we go for the ego way too fast. We want to like, yeah, I'm a business owner. I blah, 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 blah. Like all of the ego stuff attached to saying I own a business or run a business or I'm a CEO or a founder, whatever it is you're going to say. There's a whole lot of ego you can get from that and a lot of name dropping one might do when trying to convince someone that I'm a really big deal, dude. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's like that, but I really will say that that ego thing does need to be met. It doesn't, you know, but I think that that people leapfrog to trying to get that. Let's put the logo on the side of my car so you know that I run a business or I'm bit, whatever it is, right? Financial, obviously. There needs to be some amount of money for you to be financially secure, pay your bills, all of that stuff. 
Um, and then family is this other thing where, you know, at the end of the day, you want to be able to provide and be great for your family and be a stand up guy on the previous podcast, label podcast. I talked about my deathbed and I thought about the people that are going to be at my deathbed. My wife will be there. My kids will be there. My grandkids. I need to make sure I was awesome. And I delivered for all of those people that mm. are standing there. There's no fans of my bands. There's none of my clients. None of the people are there. I need to make sure I was a good man for those people. But thinking about other those things, I think I'm lucky in the fact that the ego thing got fulfilled back when I was in a band and people were like, can you sign an autograph? You, your music changed my life. And that's amazing. And, I, and it was great. And all that attention was really great. And I can't act like I didn't like it, but I had my fill. There was a point where I was like, cool, ego box checked, wave, curtain closes. I'm good. Thank mm. you. Appreciate it. And then it was very much about the money. Okay. I've had my ego filled. Let me see if I can get money right. I got to make my $30,000. <laughs> right. And then if I can get the money right, then I think I can be present and available mm. for my family. So I've been lucky enough that, you know, all the kind words you said to me, that's awesome. And when someone tells me tension and vision is awesome, I love hearing that stuff. I love hearing all that, but I don't need it like I used to need it. And I think that that's one of the, it's an impulsive thing. You think about the checkout counter. Do you want the candy bars? You're like, of course. Yeah, you want the candy bars. Like you want all that stuff that's in the checkout line because those are impulse buys. They're meant for you to be impulsive. But I think there's an impulse to getting the ego right away or there's an impulse to getting the money right away. And I think there's got to be this slow growth and making sure that your values are right so that once those three things are filled, you may not feel like you're completely successful or where you want to be, but you can at least feel like this is the right path. Mm. And so that all I'm saying is that I think in that Venn diagram, ego got filled first, money got filled second. And then now I'm trying to make sure that I'm an awesome father. My kids are only two years old. So I'm in the beginning stages of this and making sure I'm available for them. But I would only be able to be available for my kids if those other two boxes are checked. Now, the problem is a lot of times you can't be available for your family because you got to provide, you got to make the money. Or you're pursuing something. Can someone just tell me I'm awesome at something? And then that pursuit might go on your entire life, right? Mm. So I have a feeling that as a man, these three things in the Venn diagram need to be checked. And it only that. really works when all three of them are there. So with that said, I am happy where tension division is headed. I am confident in the way that we have pushed this off and started this company I know it's probably going to go in a right direction. And as we course correct it, all those things, if that thing is out of balance, it's going to start really messing with the decisions and cause you to make bad decisions. So if you can keep those three balanced, mm. I think it matters. I love that. Well, Brandon, as we kind of wrap up here, there's a lot of really kick-ass producers and audio engineers listening right now. A lot of Grammy winners, you know, a lot of like people that have worked on a lot of great records. What would your ask be for our audience? What would you like them to do? Define who it is that you are deeply, why it is that you do what you do, have clarity in that, and then go be that. I think you need to be deeply honest with yourself and understand who you are and what you want and why it is that you do what you do and get some articulate clarity out of that and then spend your career being that. Because I think there's something special when you work with a producer or work with a company that have something unique about them in the same way North Star has something unique. In the same way Aaron Sprinkle, the producer that we use for a couple of our records, there was something unique about Aaron and I knew I was always going to get the same thing with Aaron. Mm. And it was always going to be thought-provoking and captivating and intellectually sound. That's who Aaron was. He was a producer, but I'm talking about how intellectually sound the guy was. Mm. I trusted him. You know, and I think that if we can like go back to the basics of being decent human beings, then it will help our businesses tenfold. Because at the end of the day, I think we're trusting somebody, we're feeling comfortable around somebody, and it's also becomes this person that we enjoy being around. All of those things are important. I enjoy being at North Star Cafe. I enjoy the substance that they have. I enjoy the output that they have. I enjoy all of that stuff. Like we are our own brands and we have to deliver. You know, I, I want to make sure that I'm a brand of a good dad. 
And I want to make sure I deliver on that. I want to make sure that I'm a brand of a thoughtful creative. And I want to make sure I deliver on that. I have defined that I am a good dad. I am a thoughtful creative, right? And I just think that if we can find what those cores of ourselves are, it gives us a pretty powerful moral compass by which to make our business decisions. Mm, I love that, man. So Brandon, where can people go to find out more about you and maybe connect with you? What's the best place for them to go? I would say that to find out what our business is up to, you can go to tensiondivision.com. We've got several shortened versions. You can go to tnsndvsn.com or the shortest would just be tnsn.co. Or you can just look up Tension Division online. We'll have the links in the show notes as well, just to make it easy for everybody. Yeah. And of course I've got a Instagram and a Twitter. Those usernames are usually just Brandon Reich. I don't do too much interaction, but I would love questions on Twitter or whatever. I guess that would be the best atmosphere or ecosystem with which to answer questions from people. But I'm out there somewhere, but I'm <laughs> usually in a cave. <laughs> so good luck, but my I'll probably respond. <laughs> my assistant's really good at finding all those profiles and he'll just have it linked in the show notes. If you go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash 106, that's slash 106. That is, unless we make this a two-parter, which we'll talk about, Chris. Just go there and all the links from this episode will be on there. So thank you so much, Brandon. Oh yeah, thanks for having me, guys. So that is it for this episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. It is so cool to hear the unique perspective of someone who is in a similar industry as us, working with musicians and labels like we do, doing this at a much higher level than most of our listeners, including Chris and I, someone that is working with triple A list artists and musicians and able to make a massive business out of this. We didn't get into numbers here. We're not going to get into numbers with this, but let's just say it is a 10 X amount um, that he's doing with a specific project compared to something that an audio person might get. And I think there's a lot we can take away when it comes to negotiating, uh, when it comes to putting deals together, when it comes to having like, a, I guess a cohesive project and not just being a cog in the machine. I think there's a lot of value we can take from that. And it definitely makes me want to rethink some of the things I do in my own business. So uh, hopefully you have some, this is some food for thought for a lot of you, uh, especially the ones who are trying to build something bigger than just a little one and done mixing service or just a little one and done editing service or something that's just a little cog in the, in the machine. Hopefully this is something that gives you the ability to think bigger than what it is that you may be doing right now. And wherever that leads you, I think is going to be an awesome place. And then you'll be on our podcast and can tell us all about how you built this crazy, unique audio business based on what you learned from Brandon today. Next week's episode, uh, we have not recorded yet, so I don't know what we're going to be talking about, but my gut tells me it's going to have something to do with customer happiness and maximizing lifetime value only because that's kind of the emails that I'm sending out uh, this week is all based around that. And I think there's going to be more that we want to talk about on the 